don't we start with you talking about where the idea came from and how you got here? Yeah, we were just talking about this. During the pandemic, um, the National Theatre of London had scheduled to do a production of Romeo and Juliet starring Jesse Buckley and Josh O'Connor, and they pivoted and they did a filmed version of it, and I saw a trailer for it, and uh, I started crying just at the trailer. And I think it was because uh, I'm a theater actor in Chicago, and like many of us, I was feeling super lonely and super um, isolated from the community who I typically have. And so I started writing, or started thinking about writing about, you know, community theater, something I've been doing since I was a little kid. And then the idea of um, an unlikely hero, um, somebody sort of like my dad, who like could very much benefit from a, a place of expression, but who's always been told that emotion is a liability rather than a strength, um, which I think is so unfair. And uh, started writing from that, the idea of this guy who is uh, who has an eruption and that somebody sees that as a, a cry for help and that he's sort of taken in by this community and um, forced to confront something that he doesn't want to. Um, I love that there's a couple things going on here. One is uh, the uh, difficulty men have with therapy. <laughs> yes. And uh, the other is the idea of kind of the community of artists being kind of uh, finding a way to therapize themselves and each other, like the, using this art to help each other. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I just feel like some of the most transformative um, therapeutic moments in my life have been on stage um, because it's sort of, uh, I have, there's this quote that you get to do what everybody wants to do without consequences, um, which I think is so beautiful and, it, and it's true. You get to fall in love, you get to grieve, you get to get angry in a way that you don't normally get to. And so I think having a place to actually get to express all of those really complicated emotions and be embraced for it. Um, you know, now that I don't act, I actually like find myself being like, where do I put things? <laughs> where do I put these emotions? Um, and then, you know, um, I think my generation is, um, comfortable with therapy to a certain extent, but at, at one point I asked my parents if they would ever consider it, and they were like, oh God, no, just complaining for money, no. And I was like, oh God, you need it. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, the idea that that's like, we don't do that, um, even though I think there's a lot to be gained from it. Uh, very true. Can you talk about the casting process? Yeah. Well, K Kelly had done a show with Keith Kupfer, who plays Dan, about 10 years ago, yeah. called The Humans at ATC in Chicago. And uh, Keith played her dad. And I think you said a few times that it was like you were seeing up close like every night, hour after hour, just how good Keith is. And I was familiar with Keith and had wanted to work with him for a long time. I actually found an old email from 2017 where I sent his headshot to someone who was working on a John Wayne Gacy project. And, and I was like, you know, he's really good, but he looks a lot like John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> um, <laughs> That project never happened, but he still looks like John Wayne uh, Gacy. <laughs> um, and Keith, Keith, uh, you, you know, we, we wanted Keith. His email didn't work. His cell phone was like, he had a different number. Kelly got really self-conscious. Eventually, we got in touch with him. He was like, none of those things are me anymore. <laughs> and we got him to a reading. And after the reading, he just said, you know, I'd love to audition. And Kelly was like, well, the part's yours. So... Um, and he texted us and was like, my daughter would kill me if, she, if we didn't ask, could she audition? She read the script, she loved the idea of cursing a lot at him. <laughs> and, um, and we did another reading and Catherine came and was very much Daisy. I think, I don't know if anybody's seen Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. Mm -hmm. She plays like a, a very like, you know, very fun, bookish, charismatic character, but like not like Daisy. And we were like, okay. And she walked in and was kind of like, you know, had that, Keith energy, and um, we were just like, great, it's offer. And same with Tara, so Tara, Tara's a super accomplished theater actor, runs a theater company in Chicago called Rivendell Theater, mm. um, amazing. And um, we were like, this, is, this would be really stupid to pass up because their dynamics were so, I mean, so much of what you see on, on film is them. The line about Leonardo DiCaprio doesn't look like this anymore, doesn't look like that anymore. Like that was <laughs> Keith and Catherine kind of like fucking around, being like, ah, you should say this, you should say this. And, and we were always listening, so we could hear them kind of like ribbing each other and pushing each other to do, you know, to do better or to try something different. And um, 
Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was lovely. So it's interesting that, you, so you didn't start looking for a father and a daughter dynamic, they just kind of came to you. Yeah. So was that, were, was there a part of you that said, I don't know if that's good or bad for the project or? I think always good, yeah. you know, you, you, people, you, you can act as much as you want, but you kind of, the best performances I think are most of, mostly coming from a person mm -hmm. who they are, you know, um, and, and so I think just knowing that we had that juice there to, in that well to dig from was just really exciting. Um, we had no idea like what, what, you know, I think we made a film called St. Francis with a very precocious six-year-old, or uh, yeah, yeah she, was six. she was six. And and I think we got like about 80% 80 per, 80 to like how charismatic she really is. And so I think we were both like, well, you know, if we get 80% there with Keith and Catherine, we'll be really good. And, but this is like, I think we really got them on camera a lot. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you feel the same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> um, one of the things I also think is interesting is this, I, I think there's an idea about uh, art as accessibility and that art, especially Shakespeare, seems like it's very kind of lofty and far away and the idea of someone who's a construction worker kind of being part of it, like it, 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 it almost, almost in the same way that he rejects therapy, he kind of rejects this idea like this isn't for me, yeah. but this kind of the dawning that he says like, oh, this is also my life, like I think yeah. that's kind of magical. Yeah. So can you kind of talk about like the idea to find like kind of a, a blue collar entry into like shakes like classical theater yeah I mean I used to hate Shakespeare when I was in college and studying theater I was like a snore <laughs> um, and I hated when I saw a lot of Shakespeare because I was like why aren't they saying their R's we're in America why is everybody <laughs> dropping their R's all of a sudden um, but then I, I think like Mark Rylance I saw some like clip of him doing Shakespeare and it felt so um, no, oh, buddy, he <laughs> hates Shakespeare too. Um, it felt so like pedestrian in the yeah. best way. It yeah. felt, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a guy, just a guy talking. That's what I, of course there's beautiful poetry, but um, I feel the same way about Chekhov, that as soon as you like put your pinky back in and drink your tea normally, um, then, it, then it becomes a lot more um, accessible. And so I think, yeah, there's this idea that Shakespeare is hoity-toity, but really, um, it's about, you know, duh, it's about all the struggles that we go through all the time of like falling in love and being jealous. And, and after doing this, I started liking Shakespeare a lot more um, because something about it being in, in the mouths of these actors who I think really ground it and especially for Keith, him at the end, he's just heartbreaking, yeah. he's so good. And, and, and there's nothing about it that feels elitist or better than, it feels super grounded and real. Do you, um, did you get a sense that he struggled with being able to act, but try to figure out how do I get the right amount if he doesn't know how to act without faking it? Yeah. No, I, I think uh, Keith would say that he's not a Shakespearean actor, which I think is kind of perfect um, because he's never like, like the no part of Keith was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was like, uh, both hands are busy. Um, one is in my pocket and one is pushing the stroller. Uh, famous Alanis <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but like no part of Keith was like, all right, and then in the third act of this movie, I'm gonna get to like pull out the big guns yeah. and do some Shakespeare. And, you know, true to his real idols who were like, Peter Falk and Marlon Brando and these real mumbly guys, he, we were, we were like, you're gonna do this scene like you're speaking to your son, you know, we're, you're, he's right there. We, you don't have to, there's no audience, there's no stage, you know. Yeah. yeah, but it's true. I mean, he was so good at modulating his performance because it's a very difficult thing as a good actor to then be bad at acting mm. and then slowly become better and better and then be good at acting yeah. by the end. And I would like to take credit for that and we just can't. That was Keith. <laughs> well, I, I will say that- Alex will take credit. No, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was all me. No, Kelly, Kelly did, we didn't instruct anyone to act badly actually. We instructed everyone to act as well as they possibly sure. could. And and, and I think Shakespeare, without context, also feels kind of like, eh. and so what Keith, Keith, like to Keith's credit or to your credit, Kelly, that scene where he does it like a song is actually kind of hard if you want to do it like a song. Like if you're trying to do it in iambic pentameter, kind of sounds like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that detail of him going, ah, alas, she's cold. <laughs> That's yeah. Keith, yeah, that's like Keith. touching the body after he says the line and then like that, he, he wasn't directed to do that. So I think a lot of it is him being brilliant. 
It's all Keith and Kelly, yeah. <laughs> How much do you see this as revision, as you, you said earlier, Romeo and Juliet's kind of having a moment, and I think this is, this is a lot of people's entry into Shakespeare. This is the one that you read when you're in junior high school, and I think, uh, maybe I, I might be speaking for myself. I think this is one of the ones that you kind of like. You're like, ah, oh, I don't know. They, you know, it's a little much, and they do love too much with their eyes. But I, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, but in a way, this to me feels like it's almost like reverse engineered because you're sort of like, well, let's show it from the adult's perspective almost, exactly. and it kind of be, it made me really rethink what's great about this play that yeah. you kind of get cynical about after a while, like kind of got me over the hump on that. So can you talk about this idea of revisionist Shakespeare in the way? Yeah, yeah, I mean, same. Like I learned that prologue in ninth grade and that's why it's written in is because I like, had to learn that. <laughs> um, but then I, when I watched the Leonardo DiCaprio version of Romeo and Juliet, I was like, oh, that's love, they get it, oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, they, you know, just everything about it, I was like, yes. And then as I've gotten older and especially now being a parent, I'm like, this is the most inane waste. They've known each other a week. Right, right. <laughs> it's the opposite of romantic. It's reckless. It's horrible. And then when I was combing the play, looking for sections to use, the Capulet speech when he finds his daughter dead is one of the most devastating pieces of writing I've yeah. ever read. And so I really wanted to, knowing that Romeo and Juliet were going to be played by middle-aged people, and knowing that it was going to be focused on basically the father of Romeo, um, really wanted to look at it through the lens of what a waste with a perspective of age. Yeah, what a horrible yeah, yeah. thing that the parents are having yeah. to deal with after he's gone. 